toward the end of Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is speaking about the plans and the purposes of God worked out for his people here upon earth. And the emphasis begins to fall particularly at this point on the works that God has done, his intention toward us and the acts of God in carrying out that intention. He tells us in verse 28 that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And then he explains why that's significant. In verse 29 and then 30, For whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What is the good that all things work in the people of God? It is the ultimate good of conformity to his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. This is the greatest good that we could know, to be more like God, to be truly godly, to be holy as he is holy, to be conformed, to be uh, patterned after, changed by degrees into the very image of his beloved son, God in the flesh. The ultimate purpose then is to be like Jesus Christ. He has then, God has then foreknown us to be predestined, God knew us beforehand, he appointed us beforehand with this end in mind. And then Paul swings into this golden chain of salvation. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. When God appoints this end for us, he then calls us to himself. He acts in sovereign mercy to bring us to himself, working in us by his Holy Spirit. Whom he called, these he also justified. Being drawn to Jesus Christ, putting our faith in him, God then declares us to be righteous in his sight, not for our own righteousness' sake, but because of the perfect and divinely acceptable righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that belongs to him by right, but is put to our account in the great transaction by which Christ dies in our place, and we, trusting in him, receive all the benefits of his atoning work. And then whom God justified, these he also glorified. Now you might say, well, there's a big gap between being justified and being glorified, often a very long and painful and difficult road for the believer to walk. You might say, but you're missing out a lot of the things that happen along the way. Paul at this point is not trying to explain or teach about all of those things. Again, the emphasis seems to be on the saving acts of God toward us. And that's one reason why this golden chain can seem quite short. It's because it's just simple and sure. Predestined, called, justified, glorified. And the whole thing holds together with these glorious notes of certainty. What God begins, he completes. When God has begun to accomplish something, that purpose rolls on most assuredly, even in this fallen world, and there is no doubt that it will come to an end. And so the glorification which still lies ahead for every believer living in this world is just as certain as the justification that we do enjoy, having trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and had his righteousness put to our account, it is just as certain as the call by which we were brought to God in Christ Jesus, and it is rooted in his predestination and foreknowledge, in his eternal purposes, that we should be like Christ Jesus. And that's what's wrapped up then in that language of glorification, Sinless in soul when we come to be with him in a resurrection body that is like the body of the heavenly man and then the purpose of God that we should be conformed to the image of his son will be fully, finally, gloriously realised for all who trust in him.